Yeah, because right now it's showing there's not any. Zero, right. There we go. Okay, and everybody in? I think so. Okay, great. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome. And Walker, welcome. We'll, we'll meet you in a second. I'm just going to read the opening piece of this. Um, the time is now 7.05, and seen as a quorum of committee members is in attendance, this public hearing is being called to order. Um, welcome everybody to the November 18th, 2024 public hearing of the Amherst Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by the state legislature on July 16th of 2022. This meeting is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. And we'll do a quick roll call to make sure we can hear everybody. Um, I'll just call on you and you can just say here. So Suzanne? Here. And Zoe? Here. Nat? Here. Great. And we have Nate with us. And then Walker, you're a new um, town planner. Is that right? Yes. Great. Well, welcome. <laughs> Great to meet you. Um, I'm you. Becky. I'm the chair of, the, of this committee. And um, looking forward to getting to know you. Same. Um, so the first um, agenda item on the um, public hearing is to hear from our current um, recipients the, um, of the 22-23 grant. And we'll start with social services and then go to the Valley CDC and then Town of Amherst for the um, public infrastructure improvements. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing every, from everybody. I will ask that, um, because we have a lot on the agenda tonight and many people to speak, that you limit your presentation to um, approximately three minutes. And um, we will begin with Tim from Craig's Doors. I understand you have a um, somewhere to be. So we'll, we'll get you in and out. And um, Nate, are you gonna make that happen or am I making that happen? I can make that happen. So you'll be okay. asked to join as a panelist, and I'm I'm told that your screen will go gray, and you have to accept that. But then you will reappear. So it's magic. And if I'm looking down, it's only because I'm doing a little timer thing right now, so I can make sure I'm fair. Great. And Tim, you're just on mute. Hi guys. Um, thank you Hi. so much for having us i also have rachel and maya uh from my team in the interest of time um i don't necessarily need them to join us they just had some sort of key statistics but what i'd really like to do is just um give a sort of broad overview um of the program as we were able to implement it um i, I want to start by thanking you all so much it, the, the capacity for us to utilize these funds. And for those who don't know, um, we were able to fund a housing navigator um, to assist with folks who are both staying with us in shelter and folks um, who are um, unable to, because of our capacity limitations, they're members of the community. So um, initially we brought in um, an individual uh, to take on the role holistically of housing navigation. Um, and what was really beautiful about the grant is that we were able to really exercise um, and develop best practices for housing navigation that we were able to implement into our case management, uh, our broader case management offerings. Um, that individual left temporarily, uh, I'm sorry, not temporarily, uh, left the organization um, and we have rehired for that position. We're in a position to be able to utilize these funds to continue supporting a singular housing navigator who will continue to inform our broader case management supports um, until the end of the contract. I do want to emphasize whether this is the, the platform to do so or not in order for us to continue um, in seeing these successes and having um, in, in having this utility and this resource. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to replicate the funds um, during the next round. Um, we do have some statistics surrounding um, our housing placement outcomes. Just one moment. 
uh, and I will be able to share those with you. Um, and of course I can't because I can't open the slides. Rachel, are you uh, able to speak? No. Okay. So essentially we had, uh, we've had 20 guests get placed into permanent housing over this last year. That's an incredible number for folks who aren't aware. Um, we operate, the state operates on a housing first model, which basically says you want to get folks indoors so that you can then help them get stabilized. There is no affordable housing really in terms of our broader market. Everything is based on the fair market rate of Hamden County, which is Springfield. So we're having to work with these vouchers um, that support funding dollars for Springfield. Of course, the rent in Amherst is considerably higher. And so being able to navigate all of the various applications, resources, voucher streams, uh, landlord management um, has been particularly su successful for us. Um, Anecdotally, I want to share about a gentleman, I'm going to use his initials, GB. Uh, he um, was a, a, a major member of our community for some time, um, often seen on Main Street, really struggled with sort of getting settled. Once we brought him into our non-congregate setting and got him set up um, with a housing navigator and using our housing navigation tools, um, he was able to establish sobriety and has now been successfully housed um, for over six months. This would not have happened without the funding that was provided through CBDG for us to develop those capacities, to develop those databases, to aggregate all of the opportunities um, in terms of housing, but also in our ability to navigate landlord relationships. Um, which was a really important function, particularly because landlords at this point were disinterested in working with service providers like ours. Um, but the housing navigator um, was able to really work in, again, developing best practices and how we, how we communicate our messaging um, and how we advocate for our guests. Uh, so the funding has been absolutely critical in the success of our case management department at WIDE. Um, again, we are able to have a singular housing navigator again operating out of our resource center, um, but the the impact is broader than the singular position um, because it helped us to establish this knowledge base, these best practices, um, and to get uh, all of these folks housed. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. That's Cool. So I was great to hear. Just say I wanted to be concise. So <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> a little over three, but it was all sorry, sorry, excellent. Sorry. Um, no, 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 no apologies necessary. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have one. Just you had said so. Twenty people were were um, were found. There was housing found for twenty this year. Is there? Do you have sort of a, a sense of last year at this time? And I know there are so many different factors at play that would make the number different, but how many people around? Oh, sure. Um, so that that 20 number is a comprehensive um, sense of, um, sorry, I'm trying to, I guess the answer is offhand. I don't have the number directly. So are you talking last fiscal year? Curious with the housing navigator, you said it's made such a huge difference. And I was wondering if there's data that's, that you can look back and say, oh, last year we were only able to do five or sorry. So the that's okay. That housing navigator specifically was able to assist us with 20. The the broader uh placement range was was even more considerable. Um, I want to say I, I don't have the hard date offhand. I'm really sorry. I could get it. No, for no it. worries. That's if fine. I had to estimate, I would suggest that we're closing in on close to double. We also, I mean, like you said, there's so many different factors, uh, whether it's housing stock, um, the post COVID, all of the dollars that were made available that way, uh, our support through the affordable housing trust and being able to take on an additional 15, which I did not include in that 20 count. So we're really looking at about 35, um, and I would imagine the uh, in in the year previous we were looking closer to to twelve to fourteen. Um, again, though, I I, I don't want to sort of yeah no no I I totally get it. I Thank you it. for that. Of course. And um, it looks like Matt has a question. Yeah. Uh, yes, you mentioned the particular challenges in Amherst with availability and and cost and so forth. Of those twenty, were a lot of those in Amherst? Um, some of them were in Amherst. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. So our low threshold housing program, which again was radically informed by the housing and navigation um, capacities that we were able to develop, um, all 15 of those are in the town of Amherst, which is remarkable, but it's also uh, included substantial funding support from the Department of Public Health, the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, um, and the low threshold, uh, and, and um, sorry, and uh, the affordable, the, the the affordable housing trusts support. Sorry, there we go. Aggregating all of those funds, we were able to bridge that gap and to get those folks um, into 15 units that are in Amherst. Of the other folks that we've supported in in both in our shelter and um, through our resource center, it really varies throughout um, throughout the region. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Well, Tim, thank you so much. Thank really you. Really appreciate all of that information. Great to hear. And uh, please, anyone, feel free for more specifics, um, particularly surrounding those stats. Becky, anyone who wants any information or is just curious about what we're doing and wants a tour, my email is tim at craigsdoors.org. I would absolutely love to interface with any of you guys and to share more about what we're doing. We have a really cool workforce development program that we're working on to get our, our folks uh, back into the uh, into the workforce, um, and we continue housing folks at a really high rate. So, um, Great. thank you guys for your support. Thank you. Um, and then, um, so Nate, I guess next we'll go, I'll just go in sort of the order on the agenda, um, unless anybody else has a time constraint, in which case raise your hand, but we'll go to, um, it looks like Lev is here to the survival center food sure. pantry. Hi, so great to see everybody. Um, I apologize. Would it actually be possible for one other person to go before me? I'm just having a tech issue with my slides. Absolutely, um, of course. On another computer. Thank you so much. Sorry. For of that course, no worries. Um, why don't we go next to Center for New Americans? Uh, big brother, big sister had their hand raised. Oh yes. Okay. Perfect. We big brothers, big sisters. Thank you for paying attention. You're being asked to be a promoted to a panelist. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah, I'm Susan DeCastro from Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. And so pleased to be able to join you all today to thank you for the incredible funding that you provide to, that makes our programming possible. And I have some, is it okay to share some slides that I put together? Absolutely. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna do that. I'll be, hopefully this will work. All right, great. Can everyone see this first slide? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. So as you know, we're Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County, and we've been providing um, mentoring here in Hampshire County for nearly 50 years. So we're really proud to be coming on our 50 year anniversary of um, providing mentoring for young people um, here in this community. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of an issue with, um, I'm trying to, Switch my slide. Hold on. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, yeah. So just a little, you know, overview of, um, you know, we see ourselves as defending the potential of youth here, and um, in uh, particularly in Amherst. Amherst is the um, where is the location where we serve the greatest numbers of youth here, um, and Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. Um, just a little diagram showing, you know, our littles are, you know, at the heart of everything that we do with the support that we provide with our staff engaging um, our bigs who are our volunteers being matched to young people, um, working closely with families and caregivers and, you know, all, everything that we do is for, um, you know, the well-being of the littles um, that we serve. So we just like to share that. Um, you know, and here uh, just a little project overview that we um, provide high quality mentoring opportunities for youth in Amherst. And that's consistent with our mission of creating and supporting one to one mentoring relationships that ignite the power and promise of youth. Um, so that's um, just our mission that guides all the work that we do. 
um, and we're, you know, serving, you know, our focus is serving uh, Amherst children facing adversity ages 6 to 18, providing strong and enduring mentoring relationships that we know result in higher aspirations, greater self-confidence, better relationship skills, avoiding risky behaviors, educational success, and a whole host of benefits that we know mentoring brings to, um, to the young people that we're serving. Um, and, you know, and that our focus is on uh, serving um, children living in low income households in Amherst and um, our work. There's many markers of how our work is um, succeeding in providing high quality programming for the young people that we're working with. Um, we our focus is providing experiences for youth most impacted by um, racial and systematic injustice and, you know, focusing on, you know, how we can work with them through their mentors to build confidence, um, reduce social isolation, um, you know, and you know, having them access the benefits that we know mentoring provides um, as an evidence-based strategy that we know positively impacts youth. And this, you know, just a little bit about our project results. We've served um, since through um, in that through quarter four, um, with the new matches combined with the um, youth, the matches that we've been supporting, we've served uh, 42 youth during um, during the these four quarters of the project. And I, you know, have a, just a few examples of some of you know the ways that we measure um, the success of our matches. One way is through the strength of relationship survey, and that we um, during the last fiscal year seeing you know really high rankings with um, these are self rankings with how youth feel. How close they feel to their, um, you know, to the person they're matched with, how safe they feel with each other, um, the level of support they feel, what they're getting out of the overall experience. And that was an average ranking of four and a half out of five. Um, and then similarly with our child and youth outcome survey, um, which was completed over the last fiscal year. Um, you know, we had a lot, you know, various markers showing that our youth are experiencing increased academic performance, um, regulating their emotions more effectively. Um, things like decreases in depressive um, de depressive syndrome um, symptoms, um, decreases in risky or um, uh, violent behaviors. So we, you know, it was great to you know collect that data and really see that, um, you know, see the benefits that you know the youth that we're serving right now are are experiencing, and you know, and we really see how that's. Um, interfacing with, you know, the overall, the national statistics about how mentoring relationship benefit youth. And, you know, these are just a few examples of the ways that we know youth who receive high quality mentoring, the ways that they, um, the, the gains that they experience in terms of self-confidence, being able to express their feelings more effectively, being more likely to attend college, avoid substance use, um, more likely to hold leadership positions themselves as adults. So we're glad to see that you know the the data that we're collecting is um, corresponds with the with the national data about um, the the positives of mentoring. And then I thought I would just share you know just some examples. So it's there's nothing like seeing the actual people who are being served. So I just have um, just some examples of some of our current matches that were um, that were created during um, this reporting year. So this is um, Kirti and Gigi who are recently matched and are just having an amazing time together. And this is them on the top of Mount Sugarloaf and they're meeting up just about every week and are just having, you know, just having a really, really great time with each other and exploring Amherst in so many ways. And, um, you know, just really having, building a really positive, um, productive friendship. Uh, so that's also similar. This is uh, Jack and Connor Reese, who have been matched for um, for over two years now, and you know, just seeing um, they've just been an incredible match. And you know, there's a quote from um, Connor Reese's mom saying, you know, how much the benefits that she sees in her son, and you know, the fact that his mentor comes to his school events, his birthday celebrations, you know, that has, the increase they see in his happiness is is just you know really very apparent to her and you know so another great story that we'd like to share um this is a one of our uh new a very new match this is um sydney who's a umass student who was recently matched with layla and um their you know their match is off and running and they're you know excited to um you know to really kind of get out and experience Amherst together and you know build social skills and to set all kinds of you know really productive goals to work on with each other um 
here's us. This is Amy and Kira. Amy's a um, an Amherst College student. Uh, she was recently matched with Kira, and you know they're also just really having a blast together, and you know really and but working. It's really you know what we call fun with a purpose that we see how much fun our matches are having together, but that that fun and that friendship and that connection is you know is is achieving serious results, um, and. So they're, you know, another new match that having a really positive experience. And Amy is actually really helping out with uh, mentor recruitment and has been doing all kinds of um, recruit volunteer engagement efforts that we've seen an increase in Amherst College volunteers coming forward as a result of her efforts. So um, but that would be fun to share. Um, this is another another one of our Amherst matches who um, just you can. Um, could see on their faces just you know how much they're enjoying each other and the um yeah the and they're just you know regularly meeting and their um Abriel's dad is really seeing um you know just really seeing the the benefits of mentoring for his daughter um I know I'm probably running out of time so I'll just you know share a few others this is Rachel and Sahari um who have been you know matched since March of 2024 um Kosi and Eve um having all kinds of adventures around UMass Amherst and um building their, their shared um interest in art um is something that they've been working with a lot um on their their frequent meetings. Um this Diane and Miriam um this is a you know really unique match with a family who was um here from Afghanistan and you know they're really looking for um a mentor for their daughter as they, you know, had frequent moves and really wanted the, you know, the, the stability and the, the friendship of a mentor, um, you know, for their daughter. And so uh, this was a, a match that, you know, we put a lot into to um, make all the logistics work and to, you know, really offer a, um, a unique experience with, um, you know, with the friendship that Miriam and Diane were able to build together. Um, this is, Lily and Lauren, another another great match. They're coming on their one year anniversary. Um, we're doing lots of art projects together, and and so all of our mentors actually are, um, you know, just a little bit about the programs, the so the um, the regular scheduled events that we have. So we have all kinds of events throughout the year that all our matches can um, attend. So everything from canoeing, fishing, we have an annual picnic, our pumpkin pizza party, gingerbread decorating at UMass is actually coming up in a few weeks, um, field day, many other activities throughout the year. So you can see everyone gathered here at the Eisenberg Hub last um, December for gingerbread decorating. And we're going to do that all again on um, coming up the first weekend in December. So that's um, always a big hit, one of our um, most well-attended events. Um, and I just also like to highlight all of the summer camp scholarships in addition to, you know, getting a one to one mentor, there's a lot of other um, benefits that we provide to the young people, and the families that we serve and one of them is facilitating summer camp scholarships so we work with a host of local camps to and we provided um, 25 summer camp scholarships this year. Um, to the youth that we're serving, and most of those 17 of the 25 were awarded to um, Amherst based youth in our program. And, you know, summer camp is another, you know, how we know something that's so highly beneficial for youth social and emotional development. And so we're really glad to partner with um, a variety of wonderful camps in our region that, you know, what the cost of which would be prohibitive for most families that we serve, but they're able to um, access those camps at no cost to their families through um, the scholarship program that we offer every year. Um, just lastly, I just wanted to share that we put together, we have an annual report that we put together about fiscal year 2024. I included that link and I'm you know, happy to share that link. So anyone who'd like to, you know, just see more details about the milestones we achieved during fiscal year 2024 and um, the all the, the accomplishments that we'd like to share about. And we're very grateful for the support that we received from Amar CDBG and the other donors and partners and sponsors that we work with that, that make our work possible. And yeah, these are just a few more slides of our matches. You know, so Susan, we're way past. Oh, okay. we're just, <laughs> Let me just um, end. Yeah, it's so fun. That, it's um, so good to see the kids. I love seeing that. I didn't want to oh, interrupt no, you, but we're like it. Yeah, okay. ten minutes. So, um, does anybody have any questions for Susan? Let me stop sharing.
Yeah, thank you. For no, it's great. It's mm -hmm. so good to see. And I think we all probably, I'm just assuming that we all love seeing the actual, you know, fruition of it all and, and seeing happy kids is always good. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to share. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions either here or if anyone, feel free to reach out to me at any time for any other details or um, information that I could provide or to tour our office or come to one of our events or any, uh, anything anyone would be interested in. And again, very grateful for the funding that you provide. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate everyone's support. Thanks. Um, so now, and actually, let me just say one thing just to everybody, which I should have said at the beginning, which is that the second um, agenda item we have is to talk about community priorities for the next application process. So if people want to come back and talk about that, we'll do another round of, of letting people come in and, and speak on that issue. Um, so if you want to stick around for for that, that's fine. Um, we will invite people back in. Um, and now um, we'll go to... Um, nobody else has a hand raised, right? Um, why don't we go to Center for New Americans? We'll give Lev a little more time. Hey everyone, and thanks hey, for inviting us here. And um, I'm here with a student. So um, one of our students, Masuma, is also here to talk. So I'd love to share my screen real quickly and give you some context. And then I wanna get out of the way so Masuma can talk about her experience at Center for New Americans. So like everyone else, we're really grateful for the funding that you provide. And we also partner with just about everybody else who's here. But in Amherst, um, just for context, we teach three classes in English for speakers of other languages. And um, we also offer online evening classes. And obviously what our program is about is access. Um, you can see Mindy Dom, um, Rep Mindy Dom here. She visits annually. Um, we also, in addition to teaching civics, we teach US customs and um, culture and career preparation. And here um, our students are at a job fair at the Career Center. Um, we are also spending a lot of time on digital literacy this year because without it, it's almost impossible to search for jobs and apply for jobs or to support children in school. So this was one of our recent workshops where we taught people how to use the devices, the tablets and hotspots that we lend to them. We offer on-site childcare because many of our students have young children and without childcare on-site, they wouldn't be able to participate. Um, all of our students meet with an education and career advisor who helps them to get jobs where we've um, matched a lot of our students with UMass Dining Services. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to find employment for newcomers there and at Amherst College, which are both um, very regular employers of our students. So our students come from all over. So whatever you're reading about in the news, that's who's coming into our classes. And we are, we are serving students from almost every continent. We also, as you may know, we offer immigration legal services and we've been incredibly busy in this last week. Um, we've held three TPS clinics. We're serving the residents in the shelter at Jesse's house with both classes and legal services. And the point of TPS clinics is to get people work authorization so they can get out of shelter and, in, and jumpstart their lives with their families. Um, we, as I said, we work with everyone here, the Survival Center, um, Greg's Doors, uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. We're referring our clients and students everywhere. Um, this is a visit to the Career Center last year. We really are grateful for your funding, but we don't rely on that alone by any means. We're in the middle of our fall fundraiser, 30 Poems in November, where we're not only teaching poetry in our classes, but we have 80 writers um, writing every day and raising funds and a lot of goodwill, obviously. Um, and we also love to put our students on stage. So every year we're at the Shea Theater where our students get a chance to be experts in their culture and not students in ours. 
So um, I want to get out of the way and allow Massima, if you could make her a panelist, oh, there she is, to talk about her experience at Center for New Americans. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Every... Hi, welcome. Sorry. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a student for uh, Center New Americans. Center for New Americans help, uh, helps uh, students in the uh, uh, various, uh, various, and uh, I am uh, one of them. them. Uh, a Center for New Americans uh, helped me a lot. Uh, uh, when uh, I first come, uh, I know nothing, uh, just the, the alphabet. Um, they help me. Uh, or I learn uh, about life in America. Uh, I know uh, about the culture here, and uh, uh, the <laughs> provided uh, 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 childcare for my son because I'm a single mom and I have a three children and uh, uh, I'm coming here alone is uh, help me for uh, my son is for childcare and I could study and uh, uh, my teacher were uh, very kind and uh, uh, I learn about the, uh, everything and uh, I'm so happy. Uh, I'm a student uh, for, uh, in the Center New American and um, Center New American to uh, help uh, uh, the different um, part for students and uh, uh, Mrs. Sara helps to find job and uh, uh, take license and uh, I think it's uh, 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 for uh, mm, is a different part and Um, and for uh, uh, every student mm, and uh, find job and uh, help for uh, uh, a student in a school. And... Thank you, Masuma. Yeah. <laughs> so much. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, 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 now I'm uh, so happy. Is a uh, a little forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really it's great to hear from people who are using the the programs, and we really appreciate you coming and speaking so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy. As now is I can't a little talking with people because the uh, first time is I'm coming here is uh, I uh, is I know is nothing. Just as hello. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so from much, Afghanistan. Okay. Well, you speak yeah, beautifully I, now. I so <laughs> incredible, incredible work. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Does anybody have any questions for either Massimo or Lori? Okay. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Now, um, why don't we go to Survival Center? Go to Love.
thank you so much for accommodating my uh, my nice. tech glitch there. Um, and I do have a couple of slides that I have now uh, figured out. Um, so great, is everyone seeing that? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I'm Lev Benezra, the Executive Director of the Amherst Survival Center, and we are grateful to um, receive Amherst CDBG support to fund the food pantries service specifically of low and moderate income Amherst residents. Um, what is food insecurity? We really are on the front lines at the Amherst Survival Center of addressing food insecurity and are seeing incredibly high rates of food insecurity across our region and state. Food insecurity levels are higher than they were during the pandemic, including among many families who have never needed assistance before. At this time, about one in five Massachusetts residents lack sufficient food. For families with children, it's closer to one in four. And due to long-term impacts of systemic inequalities and discrimination, that is even higher among BIPOC communities, adults with disabilities, trans people, number of other communities that face additional barriers uh, to sufficient income and food. And the USDA defines uh, food insecurity as not having enough access to food for an active and healthy life. And I think that most of us, when we think about food insecurity, we think about hunger or maybe malnutrition. But an often unseen consequence of food insecurity is the constant stress and time spent thinking about food, navigating it or finding it, navigating systems to get it, making sure you have the right documentation to get to this program, figuring out what you're eligible for over here, going from this place to this place to this place. And that that anxiety combined with poor nutrition can lead to really serious mental and physical health issues, household instability, and more. Um, it could be a mom skipping meals so she can feed her kids, a six-year-old woman watching her savings plummet after an illness left her unable to work, or a young dad behind on rent deciding whether he should pay the landlord or fill the fridge. The Amherst Survival Center has, at this time, 11 months into the 20-month contract, met and exceeded all of the contract goals. We are providing more food, healthier food, and many more choices. We're really working to make the food pantry welcoming and accessible with groceries available during the evening via curbside pickup. Um, we're doing home delivery to about 500 Amherst residents every month. Language access continues to be a focus. We have a Mandarin speaker and Spanish speakers regularly on the desk, staff who speak Portuguese, Urdu, Punjabi, and ha also have handheld translation devices that are really helpful. And really notably, um, while in our proposal, we had planned to serve 3,000 low and moderate Amherst residents, at this time, we're projecting that over the 20-month contract, we will provide more than a million meals to 5,000 low and moderate income Amherst residents. Um, and so I want to end just sort of showing a little bit of what this need and demand looks like. On the left in the black box is a graph showing um, number of unique individuals served in the food pantry every month across several years. And this includes both Amherst residents and residents of other towns. The gray line at the bottom is 2019. So that was pre-pandemic. Blue and light green show pandemic years. Yellow was 2022. That orange line rising was last year, 2023. And the green line at the top, which has pretty much started and going up from the highest peaks we had previously seen before is 2024. We are currently serving 70% more people every month in the food pantry than we did during the highest peaks of the pandemic. And on the right in the orange, you'll see um, that shows just Amherst uh, residents who are using the food pantry. On the left was our target for the entirety of this 20 month contract. The blue line there was what was the 3,051 people more than our target for 20 months that we served just last quarter in a three month period of time. 
Um, you can see that to date, uh, we have served 4,270 Amherst residents, 99% of whom are low and moderate income. And the vast majority, more than 90%, are very low and extremely low income. And again, we're anticipating serving about 5,000 uh, total residents. And I just think it's really important, the last thing that I'll say is that when we look at these really big numbers, we have to remember that every one of these 5,000 people, these 5,000 Amherst residents, is a person with a story, with things they're trying to do, <laughs> trying to make ends meet while they go about it. Um, so that woman who was uh, facing an illness was someone who was teary-eyed as she came to the food pantry for the very first time. She made sure to tell me that she had always worked and had never asked for help like this, but she'd been diagnosed with an illness and was out of work and watching her savings plummet. And for her, the food pantry meant not only that she could eat, but that she was able to take some control of her health by accessing the types of fresh and healthy foods that her doctor was telling her to eat. That young dad that was trying to decide whether or not to pay for groceries or rent, uh, I, I held the door open for him as he pushed his cart out and asked just, hey, did you find everything you needed? And he smiled and looked and said, I found rent. For him, the food pantry meant that he was investing in the entirety of his last paycheck uh, to pay rent that was only a few days late, which meant that he and his family were secure in their home at least for another month. So these are really the types of stories that go beyond, behind every single one of those numbers um, and CDBG support of Amherst residents access to the food pantry is, is really critical to sustaining that moving forward. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lev. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, no. Um, it's it's great to hear how um, much you're able to help people, but it's also really disturbing to hear how much need there is out there. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, what you're seeing is the you know the large increase that we're seeing. Is that a combination of factors? Is it a different population coming in? Is it lack of other programs that you know that have gone away, or um, what kinds of things contribute to that? Do you think? Yeah, great question. Um, of course, there are uh, a variety of individual circumstances that are impacting people. Um, not everybody has a sudden illness that means they're out of work, for example. Um, but what I would say the most common factors across the board are really that um, costs of living, sort of basic expenses, food, rent prices, et cetera, are really high. Um, we know that in Massachusetts, uh, it's one of the third most rent burdened states in the country. So we see just really high costs across all of those basic essentials. And that while rage, wages have risen significantly over the last couple of years, they haven't risen enough to make pace, especially in lower wage jobs. Um, there's some discrepancy there in terms of percentages increase overall. And then we also saw at this point between a year and two years ago, the end of all of the highly effective uh, COVID era federal investments in anti-poverty programs. And I think that has really created kind of a perfect storm um, upon which then all of these other individual circumstances continue to, um, you know, continue to build. Thanks for asking that. All right, thank you so much, Lev. And I think family outreach is our last social service. I don't know if, if anyone's here from family outreach, they could raise their hand. I don't. I'm not sure I see anyone. Oh, that's true. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we um, move along and if somebody comes, they can speak out of order. Um, and is anybody here from Valley CDC for the Microenterprise Assistance Program? Sarah, great. Hi, Sarah. 
Hi, I didn't realize how dark I was. <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> on camera the whole time. Um, <laughs> hi, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I will share my screen really quick and Great. do. Yeah. All, right. So, um, all right, so micro enterprise assistance program, which is one of the pieces of the small business program at Valley Community Development. Um, I wanted to just thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm the program director and so I oversee the micro enterprise program that we do specifically with Amherst CDBG funding. While the numbers that I'm talking about are for this um, project specifically, Valley's small business program sees around 200 plus businesses or individuals interested in starting a business each year. The amount of time that is worked with with each of those varies widely. Um, some people we spend five plus hours with, which is around 75 of our businesses. Um, so just trying to give you a little bit broader perspective of when I start to dial in here about Amherst specifically. Um, so our micro enterprise program provides comprehensive business assistance, including technical support, small group training, workshops, loan readiness, preparation, connections to legal aid, and guidance for grant applications. Throughout this presentation, I'll share photos of some of the program participants and business owners and I'll provide the details about um, their experiences. So here we see a group training session featuring Amherst participants in our Small Business Fundamentals workshop series. This series is six weeks long and designed for non-native English speakers. We offer it in partnership with the International Language Institute. So we have an instructor from the International Language Institute and one of our business um, TAs in the classroom um, at all times working with participants. Many of the participants from this series continue to work with Valley afterwards through one-on-one -on -one technical assistance where they take their idea and then develop it further for their uh, specific needs. Um, here I'm gonna highlight the program metrics. So the ones we set during the application process and where we stand as of today, November 18th. So it includes the first four quarters and a portion of this um, next quarter. The number of clients to work with that are low to moderate income and uh, Amherst residents or business owners, the goal is 32. And to date we have met with 24. Jobs created the goal of eight and to date that is four. Jobs retained a goal of eight with six to date. Um, sometimes when we look at jobs created or retained, while we the 24 that we have met with does not mean that each of them has actually in business currently. Often it is the pre-startup phase. And so we're the hopefully we will get to the fact where we can actually help them create the job. And then maybe in another year or two when we're still working with them or continuing to retain those jobs and help them add more additionally. Um, the photo here shows uh, one of our participants, David's new food truck. You might have seen it in Amherst. It opened in September. Um, it's only kebab, which um, David participated in the um, Small Business Fundamentals for Non-Native English Speakers. And then he continued to work with us one-on-one um, -on -one for several months in creating his business plan, creating financial projections. And then he successfully um, secured funding with another one of our partners, Common Capital. Um, so this is how he's been able to start his business and he is exceeding the projections that we had worked with him on. So it's been a big success so far. So we're really excited about that for him and for Amherst. Um, then um, as part of the program's reporting, we analyze the populations we're serving from a, uh, from a race or ethnicity standpoint. In this last year, in addition to what is like required from our HUD data, um, we've expanded our intake form to include additional identification options, uh, allowing people to truly tell us who they are um, and not put them uh, you know, a square, I mean, a round peg in a square hole, you get what I'm saying. Um, but 
This expanded data also is giving us a more clear picture on who we're actually serving in our community um, instead of making assumptions. And we think it's critical for ensuring our services are inclusive and equitable. This here, while it's not an extensive list of what is in addition to the HUD categories that are on our intake form, um, our additional expansive list, this is showing the 24 Amherst participants in our program and who we're serving of those. Um, and then lastly, I wanna thank you for supporting our program and it's making a meaningful impact in the community. This final photo here features Egg and Company, a non-binary owned business that got its start at the Amherst Farmers Market. Um, Valley has worked closely with them on business planning and strategies for expansion. What I've shared today represents just a small portion of the work we've done with 24 and more as we continue to go. Um, we're excited to continue assisting these participants and look forward to working with even more in the coming months. And we expect to meet or exceed our goal of 32 by the time the contract is up. Thank you, Sarah. I have a question. When you say jobs created, is that um, created by, just to clarify, the by each business or by the businesses that have sort of launched and whether they're hiring employees or is that one person per business generally? Like where it's a combination. So some people like only kebab um, and those are full-time equivalents. So some people, it's, we have additional jobs that are being created at a part-time level, but when we're talking about full-time equivalent, um, that's what's being or We might add two together to get a full-time equivalent. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when we're in the pre-startup phase, we don't count anybody. Um, but then as we move in, we're counting both business owner and, um, and anybody that they're hiring. We do work with a lot of solopreneurs to start. And then as they grow in like year two is when we start seeing that increase. So we're, yeah. And then it also is how much they continue to report back to us after we've continued our work with them. So it's a little bit tricky sometimes. Right. And then jobs retained would be for businesses that are already working and are coming to you sort of already formed in some capacity. Yeah. And you're assisting them to continue yeah, so existing. that's often a lot of people who were um, our existing businesses anywhere. I mean, we've worked from people who have been in business one year to 30 years, and they have some reason to reaching out for some type of assistance. And we're hoping to either retain that position, or if they're looking to exit somehow, they're either selling or they're bringing somebody else on to do the work they were doing in a different capacity and then moving on. So, yeah. Thank you. I also have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sir. So um, I was wondering, once the business is up and running, do you continue offering a level of support, mentoring, you know, for a period of time? Absolutely. So our services are as long as the client is actually wanting to work with us. We have a lot of people who, who get started, leave, and then they'll come back. Um, it's often like at that, once they've completed their first year or the second year that they come back almost for like a refresher and a check-in, like, and we have review financials and we kind of help talk about expansion or troubleshooting different places. But yes, we're available at any phase of the life cycle of a business. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really Thank interesting. You. Now, um, is there anybody here from um, the town of Amherst to report? Uh uh, there is someone here from uh, Family Outreach. You can have. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Hello, Laura. <laughs> Hi, sorry. I'm. I apologize for being so late in. Nate, thank you for the email. I was on vacation, and so I. St I guess I still have vacation brain. Uh, because <laughs> well, thank you for tuning in, and we're just asking people for you know a three minute ish report, and um, you know, you if, if you're on vacation brain and just want to talk generally, that's fine. If you have slides, that's great. Whatever, whatever you have. I do not have a PowerPoint. I'm feeling no quite intimidated, <laughs> but um, I can give you some numbers from this last year, which um. 
uh, which is that we uh, helped 117 households, families, uh, uh, avoid homelessness. And we did it in a number of ways. Um, uh, of the 117, that actually, actually represents 319 Amherst residents. And so uh, families, of course, are made up of uh, spouses and, children's, and children, in some cases, extended family members. But so it was 319 uh, Amherst residents that we helped. And um, we helped with uh, assistance for rental arrears. Uh, as you probably know there, uh, until very recently, there was an, an emergency fund um, uh, through the town of Amherst. Uh, that, that money has been spent out now. But uh, when we were approached to, um, you know, to do the intakes because of our CB CDBG grant, I didn't feel it was right to ask for money to do those intakes. So that is part of what we do as um, uh, for a housing retention program. Um, and uh, we we did it until the money ran out, of, I guess, a month ago, a couple of months ago. Uh, and so we were able to help uh, 52 households, 126 Amherst residents um, who were behind on their rent. And... Um, Getting behind on your rent is very easy if you have a job that you don't get paid for, if your child gets sick and you have to stay home for the week. Uh, and so it's so easy to get behind on rent. Uh, we also, um, one of the things that happens when people get behind on the rent is that we find out that they they don't have um, SNAP benefits or they actually don't have health benefits or some other kind of public assistance benefits. And so we helped uh, 36 households do that, 105 uh, Amherst residents, uh, 14 um, households were going to lose their housing. We're going to be evicted uh, because of utility shutoff because in I think pretty much every lease, if you, if you lose, if you, you're a, uh, electricity is shut off, uh, that's a lease violation and that will start eviction process. So 14 households were helped, 35 um, Amherst uh, residents. Uh, 21 uh, households received assistance with housing searches, completing applications, applying for the housing lotteries in town, uh, and 61 uh, Amherst residents were helped in that way. Um, and then every person that gets intaked goes through a budget process, which means that um, we sit down with them, we figure out, uh, is there any way of making some changes in a budget? budget? And there almost always is. Uh, and, it, and it can be tough because it can be like, yeah, you can't buy pizza for your kids, <laughs> which is tough. But we also have other th ways that we help people. Once they come to us, um, because they have some challenges with housing, we help them in many other ways. And one way is we work with Bueno Isano, who gives us uh, these fifty dollars gift cards. And so we say, you know, you can't, you you can't give your kids a treat once a month with pizza, but here is a fifty dollars gift card, so you can you can get Bueno. And those little things are huge, you know, for families. Um, and then. I would say 60, 70% of the families that come in with that, if we don't already know them, they become one of our clients because everybody who lives in Amherst has access to our services anytime they need it. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Laura? Thank you, that was very informative. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. All righty, good night. Good night. <laughs> and then Nate, was there somebody here from Amherst? I guess that'll be me. Oh, okay. Welcome. It'll be brief <laughs> since there's not a lot to report on. There's three activities that were funded with a 22-23 grant. Uh, there's the um, field behind the Southeast Street School. So Wayfinders is uh, going through the permitting for affordable housing on the property and the town's retaining the back one acre. It's passive recreation now. And there's a, um, you know, it's, it's been there for probably 60 years. <clears throat> and so we were going to replace a culvert. There's a drainage problem and the field is often really wet. Um, and so we were going to, you know, replace that culvert actually now with an open swale and do some, some fence repair work. But 
uh, basically help the field dry out and we'll the town will continue to maintain it for passive recreation as a neighborhood park and so that's there's an engineer under contract to design it and we hope to go through permitting um, pretty soon and then have it be ready for bidding this fall and winter um, for you know start next spring it would have been nice to have it under <laughs> going now it's so dry but um, it's actually not a big project once it the it once you know once the work starts it's probably only a few weeks and that'll be taken care of um, the two other products are really big. You know, there's about a million dollars in public infrastructure. One is on Route 9. So the town had a mass works grant. If you go, you know, between Cumbies and Colonial Village, the road had been torn up for a bit. And the idea is to continue that work until about Stanley Street or on the north side to maybe the river. And so the block grant money would continue that. So, um, you know, new sidewalks and bike lanes uh, and then moving the curb a little bit. And so that project is under design and again hopefully out to bid this spring uh, and there's you know a fair amount of money involved in that and the other one is in front of the southeast street school uh you know where this playground is you know there's the uh, fort river elementary school project happening on the main southeast street and then there's a common and then i call it like southeast street extension or old southeast street in front of the school and the town's improving the water and sewer lines there for the seven properties and then repaving the street and putting new sidewalks in and so that's another big project. Uh, it's been a little delayed. Uh, Wayfinders is going through permitting now. We thought maybe it'd be further along and we try to you know, kind of sequence the public infrastructure with the affordable housing piece, but um, that really won't happen. And Wayfinders will probably get through permitting this year, but construction probably won't happen for another year for them uh, to start if they're lucky. So we're gonna go ahead and do this public infrastructure first and at least get the roadway and you know the utilities done. Um, and then you know they can come come on in. We are behind, you know, because of that, right? So the those projects are a lot of money in this grant. Uh, we might not meet our timely expenditure requirements. I mean, we probably won't, to be honest. And we'll have to ask the state for a waiver, which we've done before. We haven't done it recently. And although we are behind now, you know, those activities uh, should be completed, you know, by November or October of next year. So the grant deadline right now is June 30th. And so we can ask for an extension and they'll, you know, within a few months after that, the activities would be done. So although it doesn't look like much now, I'm hoping, you know, a year from now, the 22, 23 grant will be ready for closeout. And so, um, you know, we, we don't have any older grants. So, you know, our 21 grant is closed out and anything previous is, I guess a number of communities are still working on their 21, 20 or 21 grant. And so, Really, we only have you know two active grants right now, which is pretty good. Sometimes we'd have three or four. Um, and Nate, can I just ask you, when you say the Southeast Street School, is that the one that's right across from Fort River where the kids yeah, used the, to go, the overflow kids used to go like across the green? Yeah, there's a little square school. And yeah. so that, that'll okay. be converted to six affordable studios. And okay. then there'll be a new building out in front with, um, forget, I don't know, 22 or 24 units there. It'll be like townhouse style. Uh, and so then, you know, that whole area will be redone with, you know, new sidewalks and, you know, on-street parking and utilities and then the backfield. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Nate? Great. All right. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So why don't we move into community priorities for the 2025 application process? Um, and just, you know, for everybody who's um, attending, um, Nate, maybe we can just have a just brief discussion that, or just to what we know of right now about that process is that that's going to be the more standard 12 month process, not the double 24 month process that, um, or a period of time for the, that the grant will cover, correct? Right, and so, you know, the, we just applied and received the award for the 24 grant and that was about 850,000 or 900,000. And so the town's again, applying for a, you know, we'll call it a one year grant, you know, it's about an 18 month implementation timeline. And so, um, you know, and that application process is the 25 cycle. So people have been asking like, what do you mean by 25? So it's a federal year funding, federal year 25. And so uh, that's what we're applying for now. Uh, we will, the town will submit its application to the state. I think they're due in April now. So the timeline has been moving around the last few years. And so uh, now we're, you know, it's due in April. So we're, you know, this is the first hearing to understand priorities. 
the committee will meet again and then issue a request for proposals and then follow the review process like you know years past and then have another public hearing um, in February or March to review the recommended proposals. And so tonight the committee would hear, you know, what are you know possible priorities for social service funding or capital projects or you know even target areas. So it's kind of just general comments. Um, you know, we had done a survey the other year and those results are still pretty relevant. Uh, and then you know the priorities necessarily don't change a lot year to year. So the request for proposals list the priorities. And so you know if you applied last year, uh, we we enumerate a number of those for social services and you know those could remain and so if we hear something different then the committee in town can consider you know if we need to you know modify those a bit okay. and so i guess what's helpful for us from attendees is um, not to hear about specific organizations but just if there are priorities in social services that are different from years past i think we have is it possible need to screen share that the list that's on that first of the priorities on the application, because I think we we're all aware of those as priorities. So, um, I mean, if anybody disagrees, let me know. But my thought would be if people have priorities that are not those that they think should be added to that list, that's what I would be particularly interested in hearing. Sure. If that's um, this, this is the website. So this these were the thank you social service priorities from the twenty four application. Uh, so there's you know a number of those household uh, you know family and individual stabilization support services for those experiencing homelessness, youth development. And this is not a ranked order. This is just you know a listing uh, services that help develop economic self sufficiency. So there's can be a number of things there. Food and nutrition programs low cost accessible comprehensive health services or insurance navigation, support services for seniors and transportation services. So um, unless any um, other committee members feel differently, please speak up if you do. I think what I would ask is if there are any panelists or attendees who think some of these are no longer priorities for the town or that there's anything to add to, um, to this list. It looks like Lori has her hand up. Hey, Lori, you should be able to speak. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I did, wasn't sure if I was going to show up on screen again, but <laughs> no worries. Um, I think that's a sane priorities list. It shows a spectrum of services um, which are sort of interconnected. And um, I think that balanced approach makes sense. Not everyone is enduring any one or all of those challenges, but supporting each of them is a nice holistic community approach to well-being. And to me, it makes sense. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide, provide feedback. Thank you. And actually, Lori, while you're here, I'll pose another question um, just to sort of if people want to think about it. One of the things that we, we talk about every year is how to ensure that we're reaching um, all the possible organizations that we could and, and thinking about public outreach and, um, you know, whether if anybody has any ideas about public outreach, we would um, welcome those as well, um, both in terms of organizations, but I guess also just of people who would be um, interested in the work that we're doing and um, have other thoughts about priorities, be interested in joining the committee and just sort of know, understanding what, what the committee does. So I'll just throw that out there as well. That's number three on our agenda, but we'll combine it in with number two. Yeah, Zoe. Um, I was wondering, you know, if we should take um, an idea that I have literacy efforts or workforce, de work, workforce development for low income or moderately low income families um, as one of our priorities. Um, Which is kind of covered, part of economic. Covered. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Yes, that's now that. Yeah. Look and see whether it should have its own separate or whether, because I think probably yeah, broader. It's, it's 
broader, but I didn't, you know, if we can bring back the list, I can, you know, see if it fits in yeah. under any of the categories. Economic self-sufficiency, yes, I can, yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. Adult, yes, thank yeah. you, yeah. Perfect, great. Thanks, Nate. Um, so I'm just looking, I'm wait, sort of pausing for a moment to see if anybody else raises a hand to make any comments um, and see if any committee members have any thoughts on this. I know we've done a, every year we've look, re-looked at them and I think always sort of gone back to, sometimes we've rephrased things a little bit, but it's really, I mean, I think it's kind of the basic needs, you know, that, that we've had there. And as Lori said, most people are um, experiencing more than one of the things on that list. Um, so I see nobody else with a raised hand. And so I think what we'll do then is transition from our public hearing, which into our public meeting, and do we need to move to close the public hearing it's always the protocol that i'm yeah probably a motion <laughs> okay. and a vote to close the hearing and then you know for okay. the public still attending looks like there's um you know, I don't know eight or nine or so folks you still can comment during the public meeting but it's also then a chance for the committee members to talk amongst themselves but you can always raise your hand i think we allow for public comment at the end as well um, all right, does anybody want to make a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. All right, second. Second. Okay. <laughs> all in favor say aye. Aye. We just raise our hand. <laughs> all right, we will close out our public hearing and then transition into our public meeting. Um, and um, as we do that, are there any, I know you have to jump off in four minutes. Um, do you have any announcements for us that we haven't gone over yet? No, I think we'd say that there's a few people uh, that Becky, myself, and the town manager are interviewing this week for possible committee members. Um, and so that'll be great. Hopefully, if someone's interested and in, they can join, they, they can, you know, be a part of this process, you know, they'd still have to you know, we could familiarize them, but they'd have to have a quick learning curve and then they could be part of the review for this uh, this application round. Um, I don't really have any other announcements. I do, um, you know, I think that, yeah, I was gonna say that the town's doing pretty good in terms of its grants. I mentioned we have to ask for a timely expenditure waiver, but we are otherwise caught up with our all of our grants. And so that makes me feel pretty good. Um, I know the state just issued some updated guidance it sounds like a number of communities must still be working on their 21 grant, which we've, we're in the process of closing out, so. It seems like there's work being done all over town. Yes. So that's, and it's not all CDBG work, but. <laughs> I, I know, that, and actually, you know, but we put a lot of our public uh, infrastructure projects, we have all the DPW, you know, engineers and staff do all the work in-house in terms of designs and bids and everything. And the state said, well, you know, all the, you know, ARPA money or other federal money should be used up by now. So you should, you know, be able to move things along. But I don't think they realize that. Um, I think it's going to take another, you know, this construction season and then next year for probably a lot of communities to finally get caught up just because there's been so much infrastructure funding and projects that, uh, you know, there's a backlog, I mean, I'd say like two years just to move things along. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any announcements? All right. Um, so now um, we have an opportunity to discuss and review comments from the public hearing, which I thought was just so great to be able to to hear. And um, I know I said three minutes and everybody went way over, but I'm glad they did because I feel like all of the information that we got was really valuable. And um, it's just it feels like it's it's just good to see everything, you know, the money at work and the people at work and, and benefiting. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, Lori said that it's nice that we have a balanced approach. And so, you know, as we uh, move through the process, you know, the committee's often discussed, you know, what's the right number of social service activities to fund? We don't have to fund five, we could fund less, we could fund none. And so often our approach has been 
we found the maximum dollar amount and number of activities. And so, you know, I feel like we heard tonight how valuable all the services are. And so, you know, it, you know, again, that could be something the committee discusses at the next meeting. Um, but, you know, I'm not, it, it will, you know, sometimes it comes down to what are the budget requests of the proposals and, you know, how, how do, you know, how do the, the recommendations work if you're funding proposals at much less than they're asking. And so that usually becomes a, a you know, a touch point during the discussions. And so, you know, I do think that there's enough need out there for a range of services. And so I'm not, you know, I don't have an opinion, but that is something that could be discussed later. Yeah. Um, all right, well, if nobody has any other thoughts on that, we will move to public comment. We still have a few attendees. Um, so now is the opportunity if anybody wants to speak on any any topic at all, just raise your hand. And I'm seeing no hands, so I will keep my eye on it as I then turn to determine whether there are any items not anticipated within 48 hours of the agenda. Okay, great. Well, thank you to all the attendees who came to listen and those who came to speak and, and share your presentations with us. Um, we meet next on a date that is in my calendar, but not readily accessible to me, but I bet Nate knows what it is. Yeah, on the website, we say the 16th, which I think is what we had agreed on, just because all, yeah. all four members need to be there. <clears throat> and then by the end of that week, the idea is to have the request for proposals available. Right. And they're, um, because of the holidays and everything, we have a pretty long, um, you know, time when they're due, they're due in, on February 3rd. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll send out the, the request for proposals and any more information to committee members soon. And then um, on the website, you know, we had, we've uploaded a few draft documents and we can send those out to committee members as well in terms of target area okay. maps and our strategy is our strategy, but, you know, committee members look at it because what we fund needs to be referenced in the strategy. So, you know, typically on the next hearing, we also allow for public comment and changes to the strategy if needed. So if for some yep. reason we kind of miss something or if there's an activity that's proposed that seems really great. We can always modify, you know, target areas or the strategy to accommodate that. And so um, if we have any changes or suggestions to make with the RFP, we should try to get those to you prior to the next meeting, right? So we can maybe have everything on one yep. document to yeah. review. Yep. Yeah, okay. I was waiting for the state guidance just because usually that's where they might indicate what, you know, if they're going to change any of their re review criteria. So we try to align our request for a proposal with how we would then respond to the state. And they haven't yet. They're still referring us to the 24 document. So I think, you know, last year we did, you know, do that same process. So I feel like unless there is some reason to change, I feel like the document is in pretty good shape. Yep. Great. Okay. Terrific. Um, then I think we are done. And now, would anybody like to move to close this meeting? So moved. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Oh. All hands yeah. are up. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Night.